Okay, so I have eight minutes or so. Um, I think that's probably enough time to do this quick demo without actually working out the problem in full detail. I will do that on Tuesday next week. Um, so, so we covered all the topics that you guys need to know about momentum and energy. So, um, so we are here. So the rest of what we will do um, today for seven minutes and all of Tuesday, uh, both actually uh, uh, lecture and lab, because your lab is actually a problem solving session. Actually, I think it's a group work session. I had to write out a worksheet, but what you, all you're doing is you are figuring out different problem solving strategies for different types of problems. So uh, what we are doing is now we have, um, so we started the semester with a mostly empty toolbox, as in you had whatever you learned from math and there wasn't anything more. Uh, we spent the first uh, four weeks or, or first, you know, four weeks or the first six weeks going over standard strategy. So that's one big tool in your, you know, in your toolbox. You could say, I actually have an actual toolbox. <laughs> um, so you know, that would be the first tool in your toolbox. You could say that's the hammer in your toolbox. And you know the, the maximum about hammer, right? If all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Now, some things are nail, and you can nail it with a hammer. And standard strategy is like that. It's a, it's, a, it's a brute force method that's useful for a lot of simple questions, gets at fundamentals. But uh, you are going to need more tools to start doing more practical problems. Because sometimes things aren't nails, they are screws. So if they are screws, then you will need a oh wait, screwdriver in your toolbox. And so the picture, mental picture I'm trying to paint here isn't one of the actual toolbox, is that each problem will be, uh, there will be a way to approach each problem. And what I'm trying to emphasize here is that in this class, you are learning different ways of approaching different problems. And um, so, so far you have three tools, well, sorry, two tools introduced really. You have, um, you have um, uh, the standard strategy, that's the one big tool. And the second tool that we now have introduced is the conservation law strategy that you will see more of on Tuesday and, um, and you know, more of on Tuesday. And what I want to emphasize here is that these are different tools in your toolbox. Some problems you'll, you face will require you, to use, require you to use both of them or require you to think of another um, problem solving strategy. Maybe you make your own tool for a particular problem you have. So the, this situation that I want to have you look at right now is one example of such a problem where you, you cannot approach this problem using only one of those two tools. You have to use both of them. And um, so if you want to look at it, this is the problems 11 and 12 in worksheet 7. So we could have done this a while ago, but I wanted to do all this at the end, so that's why we haven't done it. But if you look at that problem, this is essentially what that problem is um, talking about. So you have a looped track. And um, you can set it up in different ways. Um, I could have set it up as a you know, flat track, and I can have a ball that's coming in with somehow enough speed so that it, enough, enough speed so that it somehow goes around and goes out that way. I could be describing that. Let me move this. I'm afraid I might break it eventually. <laughs> um, so, but you know, that, you know, how much I push it, that's kind of difficult to, to gauge precisely. So the way we can make a problem that we can analytically solve is I describe where uh, I have set up a track at some height so that, um, so that I can just use the potential energy to give the ball some, sorry, I need to put more tape. Oh. Where I can use the potential energy to give the ball some, I, some, some um, you know, some amount of kinetic energy that I can actually calculate. Um, and since it won't depend on my exact push, I'll be able to uh, 
come up with an analytical expression for that. Yeah? Questions? So here's a couple questions that we can answer right now um, in the limited time of two minutes or so. So, so you know, I can say this much, that if I take the ball here, release it from high enough height, that it'll do the same thing that you saw before. It'll roll down, go through, sorry, I need to tape this down too. Um, as this loop moves around, it actual, that actually dissipates energy. Because that moving back and forth means it's some work is being done on it. And I don't want that to happen. Um, all right, so let me tape it down so that it doesn't move as much. All right, so you know, if I release the ball from some high enough height, then you can easily guess, all right, it rolls down, it'll go through the loop and do that. Fun. Um, the interesting question comes up where you look at, all right, what's the minimum height I need to place it at so that it can actually go through the loop? Okay. Since I'm out of time, let me just generate some guesses on my own. One easy guess would be, all right, I know the maximum height it needs to reach, twice the radius. So I'm going to need to put the ball at least at that height, maybe a little bit more for friction. Now, will this be high enough for height so that the ball can go through this loop? How many think yes? Let's try it. That's what the demo is for. Huh. It didn't quite do it, right? I got lucky. But let me do it again. About the same height where I released it. Yeah, OK. I didn't get lucky this time. See? So why was this not enough height for the ball to do the loop? No, no, no. So, you know, if it's the exact same height, it would have been here. I added a little bit of more height for friction. So it shouldn't be friction. I tried to account for that already. This is an issue that you always have to consider when you're using conservation law strategy. Because conservation law only relies on the fact that this quantity is conserved. It never guarantees if the ball is actually able to achieve this position here. Now, if the ball is just literally at this position, it's going to fall. Now, if it's not at the position like it's just standing still there, it's going through a circular motion. So as the ball goes through here, it has some centripetal acceleration, which probably matches gravitational acceleration at a minimum. So that means that this has to have some kind of velocity at this position. Meaning, if I start from rest at the same height, it actually doesn't have enough energy. It has to start out with enough energy so that when it comes to this position here, it'll have enough kinetic energy. So um, the correct answer is somewhere around here. Then it should have just barely enough you know, height to do that. So that will take more time. So we'll do that on Tuesday. And as we go through this problem, you will see that you need to use both the strategies, conserva um, conservation of energy and standard strategy. Yes? OK, what about the circumference? Is that how high it would have to be? No, no. So we'll go through the actual problem later. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't have anything to do with circumference. Yeah. You were saying that you cut the circle. Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't have anything to do with circumference. <laughs> but, uh, so we'll go through that on Tuesday in detail. Yeah. All right, have a good weekend. Um, see you on Tuesday.